welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Uh, stand to your feet, let's go before the Lord prayer, and I'll get down on my knees and beg <laughs> God for prayer. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, and we're just so grateful tonight, Lord, as we, the body of Christ, here in the Inland Empire at this church, get to gather together and praise your name, sing songs, hear your word. We're so grateful that we know and are at least some intelligence not to come in to church to listen to a man or a woman, but we've come to church to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all of the honor. We just love you so much. We're just so excited about what you have for the rest of our life. It's just going to be great. We're thankful. We ask you to bless us, yes, but we want you to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing and teaching the Word of God. They're our brothers and our sisters. They may worship in a different manner than us and have different, like, directions than us and stuff, but the Word of God is always the same. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics and Pentecostals, Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. Thank you for the Assemblies of God Foursquare Denomination. We thank you for Trinity, Emmanuel, Ecclesia, Church, The Way, Bless San Bernardino Temple. We bless our Catholic brothers and Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time, Lord, do we think of ourselves as better than any of them, but see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field building, one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. May all the praise and glory go to you. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen Amen is right. If you will, get your Bible out with me, and we're going to part number two of your divine deliverer. Last week, We had an amazing week just talking about understanding that your God is a God who will deliver you, and you need to see that all the time. I don't know about you, but every day I need God's hand in my life to deliver me from something. Some of you have lost your home. Some of you have lost jobs. Some of you have lost loved ones. Some of you have lost marriages. Some of you have lost family members. Some of you have lost just people who have promised you things and never did follow through with promises just hurt your heart and you just need God the deliverer to come along. He doesn't just come along because he's God, a great delivering God. He comes along because there's a people, you and I, who believe in him, that trust him and we know where to turn when the time comes. You might be one of those people that are saying to yourself right now, hey, you know, pastor, everything is good in my life. Uh, We're paying our bills. We're hanging in through this recession. Everything is, you know, it's not great, but it's okay. I'm, I'm okay with things. And that's great, and I'm happy for you, and that's wonderful. But I promise you this, you will have problems. Nobody ever can make the claim that because you're a Christian, you're never going to have any problems. You're going to have problems. You're going to have trials. You're going to have tribulations. You're going to have situations in life that are going to arise. You're not going to want them to happen. You're not going to, you know, uh, desire that to take place. It'll be completely contrary to your own personal desires or even contrary to your own personal prayers. But things happen, and you need to know that God is your deliverer. We've been talking, if you will, about last week and about how, what a great delivering God he is and what kind of people it is that he delivers. I, I, I want to be one of those people. I want to put myself in that position that when time comes and trouble comes, that I know he's going to deliver me because I'm in that right spot for deliverance. And so we found out some things last week, three areas. If you'll remember the first one, is we talked about that God delivers us from physical limitations. So much we put, listen to this, we put so much store, don't we, in physical limitations. What you can do, what you can't do, what you're able to do, how smart you are, how talented you are, how gifted you are, physical limitations. 
What if somebody said to you, and I gave you biblical illustrations of this last week, but what if somebody came along to you and said, you know, it's never been based on how cool you are, smart, talented, gifted you are. Well, let me just say it like this. Whether you're in a wheelchair or not in a wheelchair has nothing to do with it. It has to do with how big your God is. God, you know, he settled storms when there wasn't any physical ability to do it himself. He raises the dead, opens the blind eyes. God's a God that goes far beyond physical limitations. And what we do most of the time in our lives, listen to this, listen closely, is what we put God in the box of our physical limitations. I can only do so much. I can only go so far. I'm only this intelligent. I, I've never really been very smart. I can't read very good. I can't calculate very good. And, and we stop God from ever going to where he needs to go because our faith is really in our ability instead of his ability. Yeah. And we found out number two last week that God is a God, who, if you'll remember, who delivers us. He's our divine deliverer, if you will. Uh, also to, for righteousness sake. What I mean by that is when you operate in an area of righteousness and you stand up for what is right before the world in the eyes of God, not standing up for what you think is right, not standing up what society says is right or social systems are standing up for what's economically right or politically right, but you stand up for what God says is right and the world comes against you, God delivers you because he's on your side. He's not going to let you fail. We saw biblical proof of that last week. And it's so important for us to see that third area that we saw last week. In fact, if any of this is fascinating to you, you ought to get the CD. And the third one we said is that God delivers people out of a perverted world. This world that we live in is collapsed. It's failing, it's falling. It's fallen since the time of the tree. You know, the tree in the garden of good and of evil that they were not supposed to partake of, then they did. From that moment on, it's been a downhill slide. And the world has gotten more perverted all the time. In fact, even in many of the lives of people who call themselves Christians, perversions of life, and you know what I'm talking about, dictate how they think, what they see, what they feel, how they make expressions, even what they do. They may hate what they do, and then someone takes them to Romans, the seventh chapter, and tells them there's the excuse. Uh, Paul himself couldn't handle it, but that's a bunch of baloney. Keep reading the seventh chapter, and he's delivered by ooh, Jesus Christ. Are you following me? So there's no excuse to keep hanging around sin and keep doing sin. God, my goodness, God's delivered you from that. Now make the choice to get away from it, run from it, and have nothing to do with darkness. You're in a new kingdom now, but you're going to have to make the choice to get away from it. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen on that one. You will never get delivered from perverted things until you make the choice and decision to stop. And let me tell you that, because you'll just keep going and blame God. Oh, God, I didn't want to do that. Why did you let me do that? It's really your fault. I really prayed before I do it, said I didn't want to do it, God, but I did it anyway. And you know what? It's your fault, because I prayed. Let me tell you something. Slap yourself for being so stupid, because God didn't do it. You did it. You need to make up your decision and your mind and purpose in your heart. You're just not going to do that stuff anymore. Are you following me? And we found that out scripturally last week also. So that's number one, number two, and number three of part number one. But let me take you to part number two. This is four, five, and six. God, he, God, the he, big H, capital he, delivers us. I love this. He delivers us from our enemies. And those that are adversaries that want to come along and, I love this word, accuse us. Now, I know you have never had an adversary. I know you've never had anybody accuse you. Oh, but Pastor Jim has had it all. 
And I want you to know something. Doesn't matter what someone says. Doesn't matter how much they resist. If I stay in there with God, I, he's the God that vindicates and he's the God that fights my battles. He's the God that delivers me. I don't have to do anything but stay righteous. Let me say that again. I don't have to fight any battle except stay righteous. One more time. You know, sometimes we think we got to get in. We got to badmouth them more. Well, they'll accuse us. Let's accuse them even more. They'll lie about us and then we'll bring up their thing. And you know, it's a battle back and forth like some gymnastic organization tumbling against each other doing tricks. I want you to know some God I hadn't called you to be a dog doing tricks. All you need to do, listen, is stay righteous before the Lord and God will deliver you. Are you following me? Now, it's a neat thing. We're going to do four, five, and six tonight. And they are what I call bizarre deliverances. They're not normal deliverances. Like, for an example, I have an enemy and, you know, God just gets rid of the enemy. Pfft. Have you ever wondered why there's so many bizarre, God-like deliverances in the Scripture? Have you ever wondered why that God uses these radical illustrations and then leaves them in the Scripture? Because most likely you're not going to have a radical um, uh, illustration or an example or some situation in your life, but if God can deliver in the radical, crazy, bizarre situations, how much easier can he deliver you where you're at? I mean, it's not like, well, God, I just got a financial problem. I don't know if you can deliver me. Wait a minute. Listen to what he, who he delivered. Oh, God, you don't understand. Someone doesn't like me. He's my enemy. Uh, yeah, but look at the real enemy here. And so I want you to know that God does amazing things. He takes those people that want to accuse you and he shows them up as fools. All you have to do is stay righteous. All you have to stay is stay godly. I can't tell you how many accusations have come against Deborah. Not me. I, I don't have any problems like that. But Deborah gets all of it. You know what I'm saying? She just like, everybody accuses her of everything. But I'm a pretty nice guy. And, uh, but Deborah, I mean, she gets all the time. And I want you to know something. Guess what? All she had to do and all I have to do when it comes at me is I just need to stay righteous. I need to stay focused on the one who will deliver me. And sure enough, I don't know when, but the days come. And sure enough, yeah, I will hear about it and I will be vindicated. And oh, my goodness, it's good news. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. There's this... Guy in the Bible, you know him as King David. He's just a little guy on the hills of Judea watching his father's sheep. And um, he's now being confronted by a big problem. The big problem is an ugly Goliath, the king of the Philistines. I mean, this guy is like almost nine feet tall. Ugly, a professional killing machine is what Goliath is. His teeth, they say in those days, were, were, were filed down. So if he got you in a wrestling match, he'd bite you to death. That's how mean this guy is. And he's got his javelin, he's got his shield, he's got his coat of armor on, he's just got it all. And all of a sudden, he's defying the armies of Israel. And young little David, who's just a teenager, gonna, he's not the king of Israel yet. He's just a guy on the hills watching his daddy's sheep. And young little David comes out and says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that is defying the armies of the living God? Yeah. And, and, and he says, this, let me have him. And King Saul says to David, you can't have him. You're just a little guy. Who are you? And David has a different attitude about himself. I want you to read it with me. Go with me in the 17th chapter, if you will. In the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. And I want you to look at this with me, if you will. Go with me to verse number 37. We're talking about God being a deliverer of the enemies. 
So here it is at verse 37. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paws of the lion and the paws of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. You know the story. Man, this guy rushes at this big giant Philistine and takes him out, cuts his head off and wins the battle. And I want you to know something. God who delivered him from the lion and the bear. I don't know if you've ever thought of that. Man, if a lion and a bear came after me, adios, up a tree, over the rocks, I'd be gone in a minute. This guy grabs them by their beard, cuts their throat, kills them. He knows God. Let me tell you something. In order for you to take out the giants that are in your future, you're going to have to know that you have a God that will back you and deliver you. In order for you to get to where you need to go, whoa, wait a minute. In order, you listening to me. In order for you to get to where you need to go, in order for you to do what you need to do, in order for you to say what you need to say, in order for you to fulfill what God has for you, you're going to need to know that your God will deliver you from the lions and the bears so when the giant comes, he's nothing but bread for you. There's another little story, and I'll pop it up on the overhead for you. We're talking about enemies, and this is, is about David. And David has uh, been found out to have a problem, and, and he's not going to bow down to the idols of King Nebuchadnezzar, and, he, and, it's, and it's just the way it is. And, and uh, so he is literally, if you will, he is literally in a place where uh, the his friends are being thrown into the fiery pit. And you know how the story goes is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And because they're not going to bow down to this King Nebuchadnezzar, they're going to take him and throw him into the fiery pit. And you know, they throw him into the fiery pit. As fi this, this furnace is so hot, it's consuming people that are standing near it, not even in it. But they take them and throw them in it. Huh. Of course they're going to burn up, right? Oh, no. God's the deliverer. In fact, let me take you there, if I may, in Daniel, the third chapter. I'll just put it up on the overhead for you. You don't have to turn there. It says, the Nebuchadnezzar went uh, uh, to the mouth of the fi a burning a fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. Some of you are in a fire tonight, but I'm here to tell you, you have a deliverer. His name is Jesus Christ, and he'll set you free, and he'll protect you in the midst of the fire. That's what's good about all of this. But I like verse number 27. Listen to all the people that wanted to accuse them and call them names. And then it comes along in verse 27, and the, and the satraps and the administrators and governors and the king's counselors, they're all ungodly people, watch this, gathered together and they saw these men and their bodies and their fire and had no power. And their hair and their head wasn't even singed, nor their garments affected. There wasn't even a smell of fire was not even on them. Them. You got to be kidding me. Why? It's a supernatural deliverer of God. That's who you have. You have a supernatural deliverer. You're not going to be thrown in any fire, but man, sometimes when you're under pressure in this world, you feel like you're in a fire. You feel like there's giants facing you. You feel like somebody wants to stop you. I want you to know this. Stop. Take a deep breath. Know assuredly your God is alive, seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is your deliverer. Man, that's good news. We're talking about your divine deliverer and, and how he delivers us. Number five, I love this one. He delivers us from natural problems. Physical limitations are one thing, but we have a real hard time when it's a natural problem. We say that's just the way it is. It is, I love these words lately, it is what it is. Did you know that statement, it is what it is? Here's what it really is, a bunch of bull. Because God can change anything. 
So you coming along and saying, well, it is what it is. It's a natural problem, okay? But I have a supernatural God that takes care of the natural problems. And he gives us illustrations of that in the scripture. So many times we let the natural problems, I can handle that problem if it's, you know, from somebody else. I can handle this problem and I can see the, but this is just a normal, natural situation. I just can't handle that. It's just, it just has its own outcome. It's just the way it is. It's like gravity. You throw something in the air, it's going to come to the ground. It's going to be that way. Let me tell you something about gravity. God created it. Are you following me? And Jesus broke the laws of gravity, raised from the dead. Hallelujah. He's the deliverer. Come on, somebody. He's the deliverer. So you're faced with problems. Of course you are. You're faced with trials and tribulations. You're faced with situations that you're looking at and you say, there really is no hope. This is just the way it is. Can I tell you something? Never settle for that when you've got a God who goes beyond just the way it is. He does a great and mighty and marvelous thing. And I look at these natural problems in the scripture and how God just circumvented them. How about when he spoke, if you will, the natural problems from the boat and he says to the storm, be still. I mean, who does that? Be still. I did that one time. I did. I was out fishing in a boat one time. The waves started coming at me, you know, and started to all that. I thought, well, that's it. I'm standing up. Be still. Man, it just stormed even harder. <laughs> but guess what? I'm here. So I got delivered. Is anybody listening? And the whole thing wasn't to still the ocean. The whole thing was to get delivered. And I got delivered. Thank God for this Coast Guard. No, I didn't. They didn't. I'm teasing you. They didn't deliver me. I was just the way it is. You're there in Daniel, the sixth chapter, verse number 22. Here's a natural thing. Here it is, he's got this guy named Darius that likes him a whole lot. Everybody comes to this King Darius and says, hey King, here, I want you to listen to me. You've got a little authority problem. I want you to make a law in the land and put your signature on it. The law is that nobody could go to anybody else but you for advice for one month. And nobody in the whole land can worship any other god but you for one month. In one month, they will be established that you are the man. And Darius says, oh, wow, man, I, I think that's a great idea. So he, he does something. He signs it in the law. And sure enough, they catch Daniel praying to his God. So what they did is they took Daniel even though Darius the king didn't like it because he liked Daniel a lot. They take him and they throw him into the, remember the old story? Lion's pit. Does anybody remember that? The lion's pit full of lions. Let me tell you about lions. They eat people. <laughs> Is that not true? The natural thing for a lion to do in captivity is eat. And if you're in the lion pit with the lion, and there's not one lion, there's a bunch of lions in this lion pit, you are going to be a hot meal for one of them soon. Is that not true? I mean, you're going to be a, 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 a chicken McNugget <laughs> to a lion. And, and, and so here he is. This is a natural thing. Lions don't know, they don't have a lot of brains. They don't figure out, hey, this is a friend of the king. I, I'm not going to touch him, you know. He's a, he's a pretty, you know, he's a pretty nice guy. He's been old anyway. You know, he's kind of like old anyway. That's tough meat. I guess I won't even, they don't care about that stuff. That's just food walking around. They throw him in. They don't just throw him in and take him out. They leave him there all night long. The natural thing is that ant lion's going to feed sometime during the night. And guess if you're there, guess who's going to get eaten? You're not going to eat the lions. Well, some of you might. But you're not going to eat the lions. The lion's going to eat you. And so all of a sudden we see this story. Now listen to these words. 
They go to the lion pit in the morning. Think about what a crazy, bizarre deliverance this is. And how much more God can do to you, for you. In Daniel, the sixth chapter, verse number 22, my God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I have was found innocent before him. Also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Man, is that cool? I mean, God can shut the mouth of a lion who likes to eat mm -hmm, people just like you. Now, it's just the way it is. You know, it's, it's, it's just the way it is. No, it's not. God can shut the mouth of the lion. God could shut the devourer on your part and on your behalf. There is no weapon formed against you shall prosper. My Bible says greater is he that in you, that's the Holy Ghost, than he that's in the world. And we need to get a concept that we're not people who are out there by ourselves, but we have a supernatural divine deliverer. He may not deliver me today because who cares as long as he delivers me. It may be tomorrow. It may be next week. It may be next month. He doesn't matter to him because he's got it all under control. I want him to deliver me today, but he wants to deliver me next month. Can I tell you something? Between today and next month, I have have got to learn to rest in my faith. Somebody ought to say amen because he's going to do it. The third, or if you will, number six, I wanted to mention to you about these like bizarre deliverances is I like this one from unimaginable circumstances. Unimaginable circumstances. God you know, you can imagine a lot of things. Anybody gotten into a situation that's unimaginable? Wait a minute. Am I the only one? Wait a minute. Hold on. Wait a minute. Yes, Pastor. I have been in, in an unimaginable situation before myself. Oh, you have. It's just you and me then, because everybody else is nobody else here. Let's try the answer again one more time. Is that okay? Has anybody been in an unimaginable situation? We all have been. It's like bizarre. It's like you got to be kidding me. That is like nuts. There's this guy in the Bible. I believe every word of the Bible, don't you? And he, he's on a boat on his way to a, he's running from God in Nineveh. And God wants him to go preach. And he says, mm -mm, I'm not going to do it. By the way, this was the very motivation reading this book that got me in the ministry. <laughs> it was this one. And, and, and so he said, no, God send somebody else. I'm not going. And this big fish now, this, a big fish, a, by the way, you can look up big fish in the encyclopedia and find out how big fish are. Did you know there's a Mediterranean fish, which was the area that, that we're talking about in the Bible, that could house and sustain life for 40 people if necessary? So many people, I, don't you love the History Channel? The History Channel, when it comes to religious things, are idiots. <laughs> Now you say, Pastor, you shouldn't talk that way about people who have their doctorate's degrees. Double idiots. <laughs> they have no concept. You go on the History Channel or one of those channels that's, that's going to talk to you about religion and you think you're going to get a, a real good, solid teaching. I want you to know you got double idiot going to teach you something and you're going to become a double idiot if you listen to those double idiots. They said, oh, there's no way in the world anybody could live for three days in the belly of this big fish. When in fact, all you have to do is pick up an encyclopedia, Mediterranean fish, the largest fish in the world, could house up to 40 people and sustain life. And that is not a big deal. I'll read you the story, but I got to tell you a story first. 
you know, I, I, I like to sail. I'm sailing to Catalina with Deborah. She's down below. True story. I see something out on the water. I, true story, thought to myself, it's a submarine. It's a submarine. What's a submarine doing on the top of the water? I look a little closer. I'm getting closer. All of a sudden, the tail of the submarine, it wasn't a submarine. It was a big, giant whale. It was a big gray whale, bigger than my boat, went up in the air and went down in the water. I said, Debbie, Debbie, you got to see this. She runs up and says, where, where? Of course, it's gone. <laughs> Let me call it back for you. <laughs> like, it's gone. Then she goes back down in the cabin, and I, and I start to talk to God. I said, God, am I cool? Are, are we all right? You know what I'm saying? Are we all right? I'm out here by myself with my wife, halfway through. Are we okay? And I want you to know, the answer was, you better sell your boat <laughs> and move to the Inland Empire. No, no, he didn't say that at all. <laughs> anyway, I am selling the boat, though. That freaked me out. And so J Jonah, <laughs> Jonah, can you find Jonah? If not, forget it. I'll put it on the overhead for you, all right? This is for all of you who didn't bring your Bible. You're supposed to bring your Bible in church. Jonah, first chapter, verse 14. Therefore they cried out in a loud voice. I love these guys. You see, they're having a problem in the boat, right? The boat's sinking. Now listen to the guys that are on the boat. They know something's wrong with somebody. They know it's Jonah. And God's mad at Jonah. Listen to these guys. The rest of us, we'd have come to the guy's rescue and said, we're in this together, man. Let's hang on together. We'll make it. It's okay. Stay in the boat. We're all staying in the boat. Not these guys. Watch this. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, Oh, we pray, O oh Lord, please do not let us perish with this man. Can you imagine him sitting there going, And do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleases you. Verse 50. So they picked up Jonah. This is exactly what Debbie would have done. <laughs> She'd have picked me up and thrown me overboard. And threw him into the sea, and the sea <laughs> ceased from its raging. Now, don't mess with God, is what that's saying. That's just, you know our billboards say, don't mess with God? That's, that's it right there. Don't me you mess with God, you better get right tonight. Now, watch this next verse. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Is there a next verse? Yeah. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. That's a terrible thing. Horrible. I mean, that's awful. One more night, he'd have been digested. He'd have only gotten out one way. Thank God for deliverance. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> oh, my, my, my. So he gets, he gets out of the belly. He gets out. He's on his own. He goes and preaches. You know what I'm saying? That's it. I'm going. I'm going to go tell him. He gets big revival going. My goodness, takes up giant offerings. <laughs> Sells his tapes and CDs for hundreds of dollars. Has T-shirts in Nineveh that says Jonah on them. 
Oh, it's, I mean, they had the greatest crusades you could ever imagine. <laughs> Those of you that are new, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. You know, some of you don't know anything about the Bible, so you're thinking I'm going to, you know, you go to, hey, I didn't know Jonah had T-shirts and sell CDs. <laughs> They didn't have T-shirts and CDs in those days. <sighs> Go to work, say, man, that guy taught me about Jonah while selling CDs. <laughs> I knew that place was a cult. <laughs> <laughs> here's my point. I mean, bottom line, look, here's my point. My bottom point, here's my bottom line. I don't even know what it is. Here's my bottom line. <laughs> my bottom line is the speakers really suck tonight. And, uh, and, and so I might as well just have some fun. No, my bottom line is this. Here's, here's the bottom line. God can deliver you if he can deliver them from whatever junk you're in, just like them. Go for God with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your soul, and watch the God who delivered them deliver you. Come on, somebody. Some of you need to hear that tonight. You need to hear that tonight. It's good. I finished. So here's the deal. He'll deliver you. Listen to this. I love this. Physical limitations. Forget it. It's not about how smart, talented, or gifted, or physically strong you are. He'll deliver you for righteousness sake. When you stay in there, man, he delivers people that are staying in and fighting against the world for righteousness sake. He'll deliver you out of a perverted world, but you got to want to get out of it. And I love this. He'll deliver you from your enemies. Number five, he'll deliver you from natural problems. Number six, unimaginable circumstances. That fits for all of us. He's a delivering God. Give him all the praise and glory in his house. <laughs> God is good. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say all the time. All the time. Do you believe that? Yeah. Then why do you worry? Ah, no, okay. Today we believe it. Tomorrow we worry. But that's why we have 10 services a week. You just come back tomorrow and listen to it again. <laughs> Oh, praise God. I don't know what to do now. <laughs> what do you think we ought to do? Oh. Now, nah, let's don't do the offering. Let's don't do that. No, we'll do it later. And all of you that are yelling, take up the offering, double offering for you. <laughs> let's see how many people yell now. Okay, let's do this. Some of you need to get right with God tonight. Let's do that first. We'll worry about the offering later. Y'all, this is what needs to happen. We've had a good time. We've laughed. We've sung. We've clapped our hands. The word of God was real and alive. The bottom line is you're not right with God. You're going to die and go to hell. And that's not funny. And tonight, God brought you here because this is a divine appointment with God. You've had a lot of appointments with doctors and attorneys, painters and plumbers. But tonight, you have a divine appointment with God. Tonight is your night of salvation. I love you enough, respect you, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. There's many of you that are in here, and if you should die tonight, and that's a possibility, preferably it's not going to happen, but it is a possibility, you will open your eyes in hell and not make it. And somebody needs to tell you, you don't get to go to heaven because you came in and laughed with Pastor Jim tonight. Somebody needs to tell you, you don't get to heaven because you think you're a Christian. Like whoever's the most positive thinker gets to go to heaven. Somebody needs to tell you the truth that you can't hope your way into heaven. Like, well, if I die, I hope I make it. I hope, I hope, I hope. You're not going to make it. Listen to me now. You can't get to heaven because you think you're good enough to get to heaven? <laughs> Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good enough to get there. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus says these words. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. 
In other words, you can't get there any other way. Listen, listen, I'm talking to you. Listen, I'm talking to you. You can't get there any other way but Jesus. And he tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the scripture. John 3rd chapter, he says, you must be born again. Now, as soon as I say the words born again, everybody like turns off because Hollywood movies and magazines and television shows have portrayed born again people like they're idiots. You, trust me, just mention born again in a group of people and watch their facial expressions. You're like treated like you got leprosy or something. It's amazing. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Let me explain what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Hear me. Here's what it means, because Jesus said you have to be born again to get to heaven. Here's what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be, all or nothing. Bottom line, that's the way it is. I'll prove it's all or nothing to you. By the last book in the Bible, you've heard of the book of Revelation. It's the last book in the Bible. Jesus himself is speaking in the book of Revelation. And he says these words, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. That's what Jesus said. Do you know what he really said by what he just said? He really said these words. People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And you need to know that. What's lukewarm? A little in, a little out. What's lukewarm? A little up, a little down. What's lukewarm? A token prayer, occasional church attendance? That's what lukewarm is, you know? You're not against God? Here's lukewarm. You're not against God? Oh, no, you're not against God. But you're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted for God. And tonight, God brought you in here just so that you would get right with him. Starts life by getting right with him. In order for that to happen, you're going to have to give him all of your heart. I can't make you do it. You're going to have to do it. Give him all of your life. Again, it's an all or nothing relationship. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Well, let's do it God's way. Not my way or your way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'll go like this. I'll pop my hands together. I'll go, bang! That was pretty cool. Ready? One, two, three. I'll go, bang! And your hand goes up. And I'll see your hand go up. And as your hand goes up, what you're saying by the raising of your hand, now watch this, here's what you're saying. Listen to me now. I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. And I'll see your hand go up. And he said these words, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it, I'll confess you as mine before my Father. But if you deny me like this, when you know you need to get your hand up, I'll deny you when the time comes and you stand before the Father. That's Jesus' promise and he'll have to keep it even though he won't, have, won't want to. Tonight is your night. You're going to have to do something. In order for you to get that delivering power of God in your life for now and in the future, you're going to have to be born of the Spirit of God. You're going to have to give Jesus all of your heart and all of your life. You see, I already know you know who Jesus is. I already know you know that. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life, but that does not make you a Christian because you celebrate Christmas and Easter. Even the devil himself knows who Jesus is. He's not a Christian. So your head knowledge doesn't get it done for you. It's about your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Listen to me now. Have you given him all of your life? Don't go, let's don't go any further. Let's get right with God tonight. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. Who should raise their hand? Who are you that should raise your hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. You know who you are. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. You know who you are. If you've never given him all of your life, you know who you are. I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, 
your life? If you're one of those people that are just not sure, make sure. Tonight is your night of salvation. All across this auditorium, all at the same time. So you won't be embarrassed. I won't embarrass you. But even if you are embarrassed, even if you are embarrassed, one more time, even if you are embarrassed, get over it. It's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people see instead of what God thinks and sees. Come on, no one's that dumb. Get ready to pop your head up and put it right back down. All across this auditorium, I'm counting to three right now. Let's get right with God. God's been waiting for you. Tonight is your night of salvation. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. Anything back in the family room? Is there anybody back there? There's twenty-one. Thank you. There's twenty-two. Thank you. On this side, twenty-three. I didn't get anybody on this side. Twenty-three. Twenty-four. Thank you. Got you right back here. Anybody else? There's 25. There's 26 back over on this far side. Anybody else? There's 26 salvations right there going to go for God. Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else? There's 26. Where are you? 27. You're saying to yourself, I wonder if I should do that. You should. Okay, there's 27 in that family. How many? Just one? Just one? Just one? 27. Thank you. Where are you? Or is that 26? 27. Okay, where's 28? Where's 28? There's 28. Thank you. God bless you. Where's 29? Where's 29? Do I have 29? Thank you. 29. God bless you. Thank you. There's 30. God bless you. There's 31. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 31 wise people. Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 31 wise people. Isn't God good? <laughs> okay, here's what I want you to do. All 31 of you, now, if you're serious, I want you to stop messing around. If you're serious, you raise your hand. You don't get saved by raising your hand. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to bring a friend. Now, listen to me. Let me tell you something. There's five more of you that didn't raise your hand, but you should have, and you know it. You could feel it right now. You just said to yourself, I should have done that. Get yourself, get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me right here in front. All 31 of you, if you're serious about God, you come out of the family room. You come on, bring your kids, it's okay. Wherever you're at, let's stand and welcome them as they come. No one leave, nobody leave, nobody leave during this period of time. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Nobody leave, you just come, you just come. Come on, come on. Come on Come and hurry, hurry, hurry. Okay, you guys. Yeah, okay, here, here's the deal. <clears throat> here's the deal. I know you're, if you're standing in front of the speakers, you're getting blasted right now, but it's okay. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. You're not going to hell. You're not even going to the morgue. You're going to heaven, you know? Before they find you in a morgue, you'll be with Jesus. And so, come on. Put a smile on your face. Okay, now wait a minute. I want you to look to your left. See this guy over here, his name is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you. You know how you go to church, maybe for the first time you wonder if they're weird in the church? Nothing weird at all. 
He's just going to take you over there, and he's going to beat the snot out of you. No, I'm only kidding. I'm kidding you. I'm just playing with you. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus in your heart. You need to invite Jesus in. He doesn't come in because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. He doesn't come in unless you invite him. He's a gentleman and won't come in unless you invite him. So he'll lead you in a prayer. Second thing he's going to do is give you some free information about what to do next now that you're a Christian. Hey, what, is, what does God want for you? Simple as this. Just take it home, read about it. Third grade reading level. How cool is that, okay? So you just read about it and just do what, what you need to do and what is in there. Then he's going to thirdly introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal trainers. You heard of personal trainers? Those are the guys who get you all in shape like me? Okay, don't, don't, don't do that. I'm only kidding. Uh, so, okay, you know, personal trainers, these are spiritual personal trainers. They'll meet you before church service five times or four times and they'll buy you coffee, tea, nachos. They'll be your friend. They'll pray for you during the week. Then you need somebody to pray for you. As you come back, they'll just share with you some pr biblical principles, something out of the Bible that'll help you get strong. We want to help you get strong. Now listen, the second thing I'm going to request from you, stop and think about it. You may say to yourself, well, tonight after night, I'm going back to my old church. I'm sure your old church is wonderful. If you'd have died there, you'd have gone to hell. God spoke to you here. This is where you got saved. If you can, if you, can, you're not, you don't have a church, get in this place, man. Let us be your church. If you'll give us one year, we'll give back to you a life. The rest of your life that'll bless your socks off. Am I right or not? Am I right? Am I right? Ble it'll, it'll bless your socks off with, if you'll just make a commitment to get to church every week for a year. You will never be the same, man. You will be blessed out of your socks. Let us help you get strong. And I'm putting my application, and I know I'm a little crazy, but I have fun, and I'm old, so I could do whatever I want at my age. And so uh, I'm putting my application in to be your pastor, because I want to be your pastor. Love you, pray for you, never cheat you, never lie to you, never take advantage of you, just pump you full of the Word of God, send you out in the world to change the world that you live in. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.